All right, welcome to Messing with the Market Mathematics. This lecture is going to really be just kind of an overview of a collection of a questions and just kind of a start into those questions. And what we're looking to do is see how we can analyze different interventions into the market economy with our use of supply and demand equations. So our first example, example one, is going to consider a market whose supply and demand curves are given by p equals 4q and 12 minus 2q respectively. How will the equilibrium price in quantity in this period if we put a $6 tax, we can ask ourselves, what if there's a $6 tax placed on the sellers? What if there's a $6 tax placed on the buyers? Does this make any difference? The answer, we know the answer is no, it doesn't make any difference. All that a $6 tax does is it drives a $6 wedge between that the price that the buyers actually have to pay and the price that the sellers actually receive. So that's all that we get from that when we have this wedge placed into the tax situation. It doesn't matter if the question asks whether the tax is placed on the buyers or sellers. We know from studying economics that all we need to know is that there's this $6 difference between these two prices. All right, so here we have our inverse demand curve and our inverse supply curve. And what we're going to do is we're going to just turn this into a regular quantity equals demand curve and a quantity equals supply curve, just to make things a little bit easier as we move forward with the process that we've taken with basic equilibrium uh, uh, mathematics here. So what we do is we just can transform these using basic algebra to QD is equal to 12 minus P over 2 and QS is equal to P over 4. We know that in equilibrium, we have to have quantity demanded equals quantity supplied, and that's why we transform these into quantity equals equations, because in equilibrium, quantity demand equals quantity supplied. Now that we have each equation set up so that we have it equal to quantity demanded and quantity supplied, what we can do is we can kind of just smush these equations together, because we know that quantity demanded has to equal quantity supplied. So therefore, 12 minus P over 2 has to equal P over 4. So we can smush these two equations together. We can combine them so that we can get like terms and reduce the amount of variables so that we can move forward. With this information now, with the two equations combined together, we can go ahead and solve for what would the equilibrium price and quantity be if there was no tax. So we can just keep moving forward, standard basic equation analysis, figuring out the equilibrium price and quantity. And so with this equation, we can try to then move uh, to solving for the price variable. We can do this by multiplying four all the way through, right? And we should get uh, P is equal to 24, uh, minus 2p. We can add the 2p to both sides. We can go through and see that the price should be equal to 8. We can plug this 8 back into our equation. So plug 8 in for p and we can get 8 equals 12 minus 2q in our original demand equation. We can solve then for quantity and our equilibrium quantity is 2. Our equilibrium price is 8. Okay, but now let's consider when we put the $6 tax on this market, right? And the really key point, the really important thing to remember is this step when you're adding taxes to the basic equation analysis of supply and demand uh, equations. You have to understand to keep the price that the buyer pays separate from the price that the seller receives. Because remember, the price that the buyer pays is different than the price that the seller receives. And so what we have to do is we have to remember this relationship. And if you graph it up, this becomes quite easy. So just draw up a graph 
and you can see this relationship. So here, if we had a $6 tax, we could go through and say, okay, here's the price that the buyer pays. It's what, right? So whatever's on the demand curve is going to be what the price the buyer pays. Well, the price that the buyer pays is going to be equal to, right? The price that the seller pays plus the amount of the tax, $6. So when we take the price that the seller pays and we add the height of the tax or the size of the tax, then we would get up to the price that the buyer has to pay. So in other words, we can state that as the price that the seller pays plus six will be equal to the price that the buyer receives. The price that the seller pays plus six is equal to the price that the buyer pays. This can obviously be rewritten as the price that the seller receives is equal to the price of the buyer minus six, right? So we could go through and we could say the price of the buyer minus the size of the tax or $6 is going to be equal to what? The price that the seller receives. So the price that the buyer pays minus the amount of the tax will give us how much the seller receives. You need to remember this relationship here and keep the price that the seller pays and the price that the buyer or the price that the seller receives and the price that the buyer pays separate to be able to do these equation examples without error. All right, so let's go through. We basically start exactly the same way. We have our inverse demand curve and our inverse supply curve, and we're going to solve for a quantity equals standard demand curve and standard supply curve. The only thing that's different on this is you notice I have a little notation that this is the buyer's price and this is the seller's price. When you're doing a tax problem, you need to keep those identified because no longer will those two things be equal. But other than that, this first kind of step is all the same. You change them to quantity equals. You know in equilibrium, quantity demanded is going to equal quantity supplied. So you get your two equations. No, just keeping the prices identified as different prices, price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives. You have these two equations. You know quantity demanded is going to be equal to quantity supplied. And so what you can do is you can combine these two equations and you'll get 12 minus PB divided by two is equal to the price the supplier receives over four. Okay, so now with our tax problem, we run into a little bit of a problem because now that we've combined the two equations, we no longer have a situation where we have just one variable. So we have two variables here, so we still can't solve using basic algebra. We have price that the buyer pays and the price that the seller receives. No longer is it just the price, right? So we have two different variables going on here. So it's not gonna be that we can just combine, use algebra and solve for the price. So what we have to do is we want to isolate one of the price variables. Isolate one of the price variables we can actually solve if we do that. So you can go through and rearrange and what we wanna do is we want to remember that we have just shown that the price that the buyer pays is going to be equal to the price the seller receives plus six or the price that the seller receives is equal to the price the buyer pays minus six. Right? So we want to remember that material as we go forward. Why? Because if we can isolate one of the variables, then we can sub in the other one into the equation. I'll show you how this works. Right? So if we can isolate from our original situation, this price that the supplier receives is equal to 24 minus 2 times the price that the buyer pays by simply using algebra to go through arrange this equation here, we can come up with the price the supplier uh, receives isolated as a variable. Now what we can do is we can uh, this equation that we just used, this price that the supplier receives is equal to the price the buyer pays minus six, right? So if we go through and we look at just this price the supplier receives is equal to the price the buyer pays minus six. Well, now what we can do is we can substitute that in, right? So look at this next step. What we go through and do is we change the price that
buyer or the price that the seller receives to PB minus six, right? Because we know PS is equal to PB minus six, right? That was one of our relations that we had. The price the seller receives is equal to the price the buyer pays minus the amount of the tax. Well, now what we have is the price the buyer receives is the only variable in the equation. Now we can solve for the price that the buyer actually receives, right? So we can go through and solve this element, right? So now we can go through basic algebra after this substitution, and we can go through and solve. So PB is equal to 30 minus 2PB. Solve from there, and you get the price the buyer receives is $10. With this information discovered, we have all different kinds of ways we can go and we can solve for the information. So what I'm gonna do is just simply plug that PB equals 10 back into our inverse uh, demand curve and we can solve for the quantity demanded in the market with the tax. And we can just plug in that 10 for our price that the buyer pays equals 12 minus two QD. We can solve for the quantity demanded and we end up with a quantity of one. And then we can also plug that price the buyer pays of 10 into our basic tax uh, equation, our relationship, PS equals PB minus six, right? Because we have that there. We know that the price that the buyer pays is going to be $6 more than the price that the seller receives, right? From our basic wedge method analysis of looking at the graph. So we can just simply plug 10 in uh, for the price the buyer pays. 10 minus 6 is going to be 4. So the price the seller receives is going to be 4. All right, so our results are that demanders will pay $10. The sellers will have to pay $6 on each of those units in terms of taxes, right? And so they will just receive a price of $4. Right, so demanders pay 10, the sellers receive four, the tax is $6. You can plug this price the seller receives of $4 back into the original equation for the supply curve to find quantity supplied. What should your quantity supplied be? Well, it should be exactly the same as your quantity demanded, right, which would be one. All right, an additional little challenge question here that I think is really worth the while to go through. Can you do the math on this situation if we changed it from a $6 tax to a $6 subsidy, right? The process is going to be exactly the same, but you need to understand how a subsidy is different than a tax. What is the relationship between the price that the buyer pays and the price the seller receives with a subsidy. Write this as an equation and substitute it in just like we did with a tax when you have two price variables remaining. So do exactly what you just did as you when you did the tax situation. Keep the price the buyer pays unique to unique from the price that the seller receives. But when you run into a situation where you have both those price variables left, you can substitute in this relationship between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives when you have a subsidy. Think about that relationship graphically with a subsidy and the question should be pretty easy to solve from there. Okay, let's imagine now we have a new example problem, a new set of supply and demand functions. And we want to go through, and this time we want to think about a binding price floor. So we have a price floor at $4. And now with these equations, you have a different type of intervention, not a subsidy, not a tax, but an actual price is set within this market. So we have a price floor set. The price floor is set at $4. And the question is asking us, what is the amount of excess supply within this market? This is actually a little bit easier here. Uh, we know the price, 
right? So we know the actual price of the market, this market, it's four, and we're given these two equations. So we want to go through and say, okay, well, hmm, our quantity supplied at a price of four is going to be what? Well, just plug in at a price of four, what will our quantity supplied be? At a price of four, our quantity supplied will be four. And then you can do the same thing and say, hmm, uh, look at my demand curve here. We know our demand curve is QD equals six minus the price the buyer has to pay. We can go through and we can say, all right, well, what's our quantity demanded then if the price that the buyer has to pay is four dollars, right? So if we have six minus four, we get a quantity demanded of two. So we can go through and we can say our supply, quantity supplied is four, our quantity demanded is two, and therefore our excess supply is two units. Four minus two would be two units, right? So we have a surplus or excess supply of two units in this situation. I have a few last, addi last additional challenge questions for you to think about stemming off of example two. Now, if we think about example two and we have the same supply and demand equations, what if there is a price ceiling, not a floor, but a price ceiling at $4? What is the quantity in the market? In answering this question, go through as a little kind of hint here. How would you know not to do what we just did for a price floor? In order to answer that, you need to think about what happens in terms of quantity demanded and quantity su supplied when you have a price floor versus a price ceiling. When we just had a price floor, we ended up with quantity supplied being greater than quantity demanded. Did that make sense? It should make sense when you have a price floor. But what if I said there was a price ceiling at $4? Should we end up at a situation where we end up with quantity supplied being greater than quantity demanded? Think about it. Go through and prove it to yourself. It's an extra little challenge for you. You would not do what we just did to figure out the quantity within the market if there was a price ceiling at $4 instead of a price floor. Another little challenge question here would be, that's very related to that, is could you identify which binding intervention was implemented, either a price floor or a price ceiling, if given just the price and the supply and demand equations? All right, so if I gave you the intervention's price and said, I know this is either a price floor or a price ceiling, it is not the market price, could you identify which intervention it was, either a price ceiling or a price floor, if I gave you that price and supply and demand equations? Think these kind of questions through with example two. If you've got questions, come and see me, try and work through them, try and ask other people, and see if you can take on this market math that we are doing here.